personas, match them to some keyword research. Then you want to follow the rules, do an audit, see how close you're matching the actual rules published by Google as well as industry best practices. You would also stack yourself up against your major competitors in this bucket. So kind of see where you're at in relation to following the rules. And then when all that is done, actually this is where we get into Marissa's stuff. Actually take a look at how people are interacting with your website and start making changes based on how people are interacting with your website. Um, you would actually need to start measuring stuff, which is why I usually start this session or I end the session with saying, you know, step one is get your accounts with Google. There's a free account with Google you should get. It's called Google Search Console. There's a free account with Bing. It's called Bing Webmaster Tools. There's Google Analytics, all of which is free, though Google Analytics needs to be set up properly. But it's free data. You should set that up so you have some insight about how people are interacting with your web page and your, web, and your URLs. All right, so there's a whole bunch of stuff to learn. This stuff gets changed pretty rapidly, and you have to know, you have to have a process in place in order to actually move the needle. So technical. This is mostly just to overwhelm you because I do have this whole workshop about technical. There are a ton of things you need to follow, and Google, there's a full list here if you want to check out that audit checklist. Um, but Google keeps adding to this, to be honest. It, they don't really take away. <laughs> I do audits, they're usually 160 pages depending on the size of the site. There's a lot of stuff to check. And especially now with mobile and AMP, or maybe you're playing around with the JavaScript framework, all of that stuff seems like particularly AngularJS developed by Google. You would think it's SEO friendly. It's absolutely not. I've audited sites with AngularJS and it would show a blank screen to Google. Horrible. So there's all sorts of stuff you could do in this bucket that could cause havoc. What I'm instead going to tell you is that it's really powerful to make these fixes. So this is actually an older case study from one of my clients where you can see the level of errors that were going on. And it was a website where all they were doing is publishing blog posts. And we all came to an agreement. We have to fix the SEO stuff. What if we just did technical fixes for the first three months? You guys continue publishing like you are, but we're not going to weirdly promote anything or do anything out of the ordinary. All we did is fix technical stuff, and we increased traffic by almost 30% in three months just by making it easier for Google to crawl. And you want to know why? Google actually doesn't have unlimited resources to crawl your website. It's a business. So it has to make this decision about whether or not your website is worth the effort. There's a whole bunch of stuff that goes into that. Um, but ultimately, if you're making it too difficult to Google, for Google to get to your web pages and understand them and put them in the index, they're going to give up and go find somebody else, basically. So that's why this stuff can be really, really powerful. It could also be super powerful if you're a website that accidentally moved to AngularJS and lost all of your search rankings because Google can't find anything. Or you decided there was too much text on the page, you made it all image-based. So there's nothing for Google to grab. I've had clients like this. So anyway, there's a bunch of things that you can do in the technical end that could really, really mess up stuff. If you're interested in deep diving into that, there's a bit.ly for my tech SEO course in November. Um, but it's a privilege be indexed, yeah? And most of the time you're going to be okay if you're a smaller site, but it could depend on what you build on. And it's important to do the tech stuff first, <coughs> otherwise you'd be spending a lot of time and it doesn't matter because Google actually put you in the index. If you're curious about whether or not you're in the index, Google Search Console, the free account, will show you how many pages are indexed. So I don't know how bad my website is, that's your first place to go check. Did I answer your question? Um. If I can go to Google Council and, well, um, I'm going to start a portfolio page for myself. I'm thinking Squarespace. Um, are those pages be good or bad for, for being in the database to begin with? Is WordPress a superior being for that? It depends. WordPress is innately, if you use the right plugins, it's probably going to end up being more SEO friendly. So you should use the Yoast SEO plugin, and you're probably a little bit better out the gate. Okay. Yeah. I know there's a lot of people with Squarespace that got a little stuck trying to make it SEO friendly, and I don't know of anybody who got stuck with WordPress trying to make it SEO friendly. There's enough plugins where you can get it there. Okay, so quality content. So we've, we've talked about the technical stuff, the quality stuff, and this is where I tell you that for about, oh gosh, I think three years, for whatever reason, Google decided to play the every algorithm's got a name and it's going to be a black and white animal kind of game. So it was like the zoo for a year and a half or so. Um, now, part of the reason why the first algorithm update was named after a cute animal, it, and this is your cocktail hour thing, did you know 
is because the engineer's last name was Panda. Uh -huh. And then they thought it was cute, so they just kept naming. I mean, the industry had named them before, because otherwise this gets confusing. So the big ones we named. Um, but then Google just decided we're going to start naming them. And now they roll them out so frequently because of the machine learning, there's no big blips anymore. So there's no named algorithm updates. It's very hard to track. But some of these big changes, the ones that have got the pretty names like Panda, and the next one is Penguin, <laughs> um, are pretty substantial and they're a big piece of how the search engine works now. So that's why I want to review them with you. So Panda, if everybody remembers how eHow used to be super popular and you saw their pages everywhere, now suddenly you're not seeing eHow anymore. Yeah, that's what this was fixing. So Google was like, I think a lot of the stuff that's appearing in Google search is super thin and not useful for the user, so we're gonna fix that. So this is the quality control update. Um, now, and a piece of this is also that Google and Bing have, Google calls them human raters, but both of them employ part-time people to take a look at spammy search results and actually evaluate your content. Whoa, so a human being is actually looking at whether or not your content is good enough. And if you happen to be a site that's a medical site, you get sort of a higher bar to walk through. Um, so anyway, it was released in 2011. It's still part of it. Um, you could potentially have rankings disappear because Google's discovered a whole chunk of your website is super thin content. could also be accidental thin content. I work with some clients that have done this, where you transformed a PowerPoint into web pages and it turns out it's a big image with no text. I know you didn't do that on purpose, but you just forced Google to crawl all of these pages that have nothing on them. Thin content. So there's those kind of things that you could be paying attention to. And this is where I also show you that there is this guidebook from Google you should all download. It's called the uh, Search Webmaster's Guide. Search Engine Webmaster's Guide, I think. I'll, I'll find you the link. But anyway, so there's a whole guide from Google. This is a screenshot from it. And it walks you through the rules that um, Google wants webmasters to be aware of. Not necessarily all of them, but considering there's some stuff in black and white, you should probably read it. Um, but this one basically says, hey, if you want to appear for that topic, you should actually put that topic on your page. And maybe you should do some keyword research. That's what this whole screen talks about. Uh, let me give you an example. So back when I got started with SEO, I worked in a nonprofit, and I had to train these volunteer centers to post these. It was, I was working at 1-800-volunteer.org, so they were posting these volunteer opportunities. So one of them came to me and said, I posted an opportunity for a docent, but nobody signed up. Why would that be? And I said, well, possibly it's because not many people know what a docent is. If you flip it to a museum tour guide that has more search volume, you're going to get more people apply to it. So that's the piece of keyword research, using an actual tool that looks at volume from Google about what words people are actually using to search for your topic. Not the ones you like, particularly if you might be in a government agency that likes wonky words, not those words but the actual real life words that people use. One more example. So I worked for, I launched the strategy for healthit.gov, the digital strategy, and was really working with them initially because everybody was talking about electronic medical records because there was software out there for that. But they're promoting electronic health records, which is actually bigger. Medical records are just kind of one individual thing. Your health record is a bunch of medical records stacked together, right? So anyway, they didn't want to use the word electronic medical records because it was inaccurate. They only wanted to publish stuff with electronic health records. Well, I told them if you do that, you're not capturing anybody via Google search, just everybody searching for EMR because nobody knows what the difference is. So we actually finally launched a blog post that was literally just EMR versus EHR. What is the difference? It was an explanatory blog post that brought people in on one term and educated them about the correct term. At the beginning of a campaign, there was basically no volume on electronic health records, and at the end of the campaign, there was. So there you go. But you have to actually use the words that your target audience is using, even if you possibly don't like them. You've got to figure out a way to make that work, okay? Um, and then a caveat. You're seeing a screenshot here of Google AdWords, and Google says in their guide, use AdWords. AdWords is not reliable for SEO. Um, there are many reasons. I have a blog post about it. Um, but if you want to start doing keyword research, come talk to me. There's a couple of tools that are legit. You will have to pay for them. But we can talk offline about why AdWords might not be the best. Yeah. So are you saying the Keyword Planner tool is that not one. accurate? No. Okay. It was always built for paid advertising. But it's gotten progressively more inaccurate for organic search to the point where you should absolutely not use it now. The numbers are unreliable. What is our number one tool for keyword research? I really like Ahrefs right now. I also use Moz's tool, but Moz's tool seems to not have as much data as Ahrefs does. 
Yeah. What is that? Age what? Um, it's A H R E F S. It's a tool set that has other stuff, but those are the two big ones, the legit ones that I would have to take a look at. They're both paid tools, right? They're paid. Yeah, unfortunately. But I'll send you the post about why you shouldn't use a keyword tool. Um, okay, so then you also need to know who you're talking to because sometimes you might pick words that your target audience is not actually using. So this is actually an example of a persona that bakes in the keywords that they're actually using, which means you have to talk to your users to figure that out. Um, it used to be Bing had a neat little tool that would match with demographics to keywords, but it's not available anymore. Here's some of the content quality questions that those raters are, have to ask of the search results they're presented. Um, there's a whole list, it's worth reading the whole list, but this is a sample because I just think it's important for you to know what these questions are because, mind you, you're not going to get a human review unless it's a spammy search result, but I still think Google has decided this is what quality is, so writing to this makes a lot of sense. And so basically it's like, would you trust what's in the article? Did people write this just for spammy search reasons? Is the person an expert behind it who wrote the article? And then I've highlighted in red, I think the most important one, does the page provide substantial value when compared to other pages in the search result? Which means if you're going to write on a topic, perhaps you should look at the search result and see what's currently appearing before you start writing. And here, let me give you another example why. So I'm working on a pro GMO client and they wanted to write a pro GMO corn uh, sort of answer, justification for why GMO corn, right? They only wanted to write three lines of text. That's, that was the approved text that they wanted to use and they wanted to, okay, link building. So black and white animal again, so this is penguin. So penguin used to penalize websites that had um, bought links. So if you've paid links and they're coming into your website and you did that in a nefarious fashion, Google could figure it out and Google would take your entire website out of search or huge chunks of your website. Plenty of SEOs were making good money on evaluating, doing penguin audits and helping sites clean up their backlink profile and every webmaster was wander wandering around worried like do I have bad backlinks that could tank me in Google search. Google softened it, thank God, because it used to be really tough to manage this issue because people can link to you all the time, right? And you can't control who links to you. Um, so now what they do is they can figure out if it's spammy links that are coming in and they discredit them. So it's not like they dump you. They just go, oh, that's spammy. I just won't look at that. I won't give you an extra boost, basically, from that link coming in. Interestingly, this shut down a little cottage industry. And I actually got an email from this SEO company that was doing this. That's fascinating. Um, so you could actually, maybe three months ago, um, bid in a pay-per-click sort of way for a Forbes writer, legit writer on Forbes to include your company link. Fascinating. So it was this whole cottage industry where you could get what looks like an official link from HuffPost and Forbes and a couple of these other big name websites that normally you can only land there doing real PR. But this was a, like a pay-per-click model. Um, I'm sure you could still get caught up in that. If you didn't know that that's not gonna help you, you could still pay this company to get those links. But now Google knows and just won't give you the credit for it. So you've just paid whatever it is, five grand, 10 grand for a link from Forbes, and it's not gonna help you. Yeah. Um, occasionally in Google Analytics, I'll see a refer site like from Black Hat World or some random thing that I have no idea what, you know, where mm -hmm. that came from. Is that weird? Is it that could weird? be. It also could come back to the fact that Google Analytics needs to be heavily modified when you set it up to eliminate what's called referral spam, mm -hmm. which is the bane of everybody's existence who runs a Google Analytics account. And I'm sure Maris is gonna talk about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, but it's a problem and it puts spam in a bunch of places, not even just the referral bucket, but most people notice it in the referral bucket. They're like, what weird website is this? I don't have anything over there. And they do it so that you'll check it out. Like that's uh -huh. the thing to go to their website. Yeah. It's a huge problem. If you run a small site, well, I was looking at a small business website and they thought they were getting visitors and they weren't. It was all referral spam, put that way. I know, just so sad. Um, okay, but anyway, you don't want to pay for links. Don't do anything shady. It's not worth the effort. You do need to build quality links. They need to be semantically related to you. So you need to do good old fashioned PR, basically. And if you're local, you actually don't need to be worried too much about whether it's the big websites that link to you, just local. 
matters. So it could be the local mom and pop, whatever, just as long as it would make sense in real life for them to promote you. That's really the, the bar you should play with. Um, and this is Google and Bing saying it. And so um, Bing even says stuff about social media that Google does not say. And so Bing will say, you know, if you've got a good social media following that builds up brand equity, you sort of notice that, et cetera, et cetera. Mind you, Bing does not update their webmaster tools guidelines very frequently. So you can take it with a grain of salt. Google updates theirs possibly every eight months or so. Okay, so if you're gonna build inbound links, they need to be natural, not paid for. Um, generally high authority, unless you're a local business. Um, you can't build them too correctly. You don't want to tell them all, please link to me with my target keyword. Don't do any of that weird stuff. Just let a person normally promote you and you'll be fine. Um, and that you're going to need different links based on your target keyword. That's the interesting part. So based on what you want to rank for, you might actually discover, look, everybody else has got links from educational institutions who are ranking in the top 10 of Google. Hmm, I think possibly I need to get a link from an edu educational institution. Okay, and then UX. Um, and that's because Google has gotten very smart about who you are. So it used to be when you were on the internet and you were a dog, Google did not know you were a dog. But Google now knows exactly who you are. How many people here sign out of their Gmail account when they're searching? A few. Sometimes. Huh? Sometimes. There you go. How many people know there's Chrome, Chrome Incognito? Okay, so some people know how to kill a little personalization. By the way, I don't really know how much personalization that kills. I was looking for a web analytics article a couple months ago, and I found my friend Iggy, who's not the biggest web analytics blogger on like page two. So I'm just saying that in theory it's unpersonalized, but they'll still know what your IP address is half the time when you're in cognitive. You've noticed this, you're shaking your head back there. Yeah, so this is why people end up buying tools, is in order to get a, like a clear picture of stuff that's not personalized. All right, some more animals. So this is Hummingbird. Hummingbird was, and this is in order too, by the way. So after Penguin, there was Hummingbird. And Hummingbird was basically a completely reworking of the Google algorithm. And it was really focused around mobile search and understanding what we were actually meaning, not what we were saying. Because suddenly we're all talking to our phones and we're not being the most articulate, per se, when we're actually talking into our phones. And so they got really good about understanding that if I'm searching for hot dog, I own a mixed lab. I'm probably looking for an overheated canine. And they can figure that in a bunch of ways. I'm probably not actually looking for a hot dog to eat. Don't tend to Google very often. And Google will switch it for me. Um, and so they're really understanding the concepts of keywords. Around the same time, they started building out the knowledge graph. You've seen those things in, in search result where it's pulling from Wikipedia and stuff. They also talk a lot about using something called schema, where you can actually mark up your pages with additional code. So if you're talking about a book, you use the piece of code that says, I'm talking about a book. Now all the search engines will understand you're talking about a book. So anyway, they started getting very smart about who you are and how you're connected, and they started using that in search results. And then they rolled out RankBrain. So RankBrain originally, that's the machine learning piece of Google. It was originally rolled out just for all those queries that they were confused about. Something like 14% of every query, it might even be higher than that, that Google sees every day they've never seen before. So a huge percent of the queries they're seeing, they just have no idea how to answer. So what they did is they showed, throwed machine learning at that, and now machine learning is a piece of the everyday algorithm. Now they don't tell you per se how machine learning is impacting search rankings, but this is what machine learning does. Machine learning is I give a test to a machine, and it's a pass-fail. So if you put that up against search, keyword, how did people interact with it? Was it a pass or a fail? So you can just envision that they're probably paying attention to click-throughs, because they can measure that. They're also on your Android device in Chrome, by the way, being a little tin hatty, but they are. And they can measure whether or not you left search and whether you came back and whether you reworked your search or you stayed or you scrolled down. All of that's kind of data they've got access to. So with machine learning, if you fail a lot, people don't click on what you've got presented there possibly you would stop appearing for that keyword search. Possibly, yeah? Or if you're doing a really great job and getting a lot of people clicking on your listing, perhaps you'd go up. And the industry has seen a little bit of this. So I come back to a meta title and description, which are the two pieces on a web page that become part of your search snippet in Google Search. And if you're not paying attention to them, you might want to pay attention to them because that's what gets presented to the user. That's your ad and free search. That's what encourages them to click. Um, Okay, 
Deep breath. Everybody's head exploding. That was a lot. <laughs> Deep breath. Breathe in, breathe out. I would love to say I'm done. I'm not actually though. Um, so, because there's exception to the rules, of course there are. It depends on your query. I'll give you a couple examples. Um, so local search. This is hard to read. The source is down there. You can get the whole guide. The gist is local search pivots to where you're standing oftentimes. So if you're searching on your phone for a restaurant, everything configures around where you're standing. So maps become really important. Using local geographic stuff becomes really important. Um, playing with Google and your Google business page, your Yelp listing, all that kind of jazz becomes really important. There's also this thing called citations, which is everybody who's mentioned you with your name, address, and phone number, your NAPs, all that has to match for them to really understand you. So that's the gist of stuff that's involved in local SEO. Doesn't mean you don't also do what is my target audience looking for? Have I written to them well? Have I promoted it? Oh gosh, you have to do all that. But then you actually have to do all this stuff too. Because oftentimes, depending on the keyword, there'll be tons of map listings before they even get to web pages. So there's your local challenge. And then the other side is international. So say you want to appear both here in Spanish and Mexico in Spanish. You have to tell the search engine that you have a difference. You also have to personalize based on the type of Spanish that's spoken. You also have to get links from Mexico. That's the other challenge. And then if you flip a different country that's even more complicated, say like Germany, there's different social networks there that are more important. There's different interactions going on. They don't, people don't link as much in Germany, et cetera, et cetera. So depending on where you go with SEO, when you go beyond like I'm Coke, well, I, Coke's not a good example. I'm Canvas DC maybe, and I just want to be found here. And you go a little bit broader where you're like Coke and I want to be found international, that's your challenge. Um, because there's also different platforms, Google's not dominant in every country, in a lot of them, but not everyone. Everyone's familiar with the fact that Baidu's in China, right? And you've got Yandex in Russia and other parts of the sort of Russian block there. Um, and then the social platforms switch quite a bit. And Japan used to be, even though it was Yahoo, it was powered by Google. Weird quirk. So you would have to know all that stuff. <laughs> On top of actually talking the language of the person in the country. And then if you move to those Asian countries, if you've noticed, the web pages are blinky and crazy and drive <laughs> us nuts. But that's what works for them. Okay, so you would have to have a website that worked like that because if you want your users to click on the website and use the website, which is part of ranking, that's what you would have to do. So anyway, there's your challenge if you want to go international. And then let's talk about personalization. So this is a screenshot from Search Love in 2016. This is a get set, I think it's get set, no, Search Metrics report. So Search Metrics is a big enterprise SEO tool. It has a big chunk of data in there about different industries and different websites. And this is a report that came out from them looking at what are the ranking factors, the checklist, per industry. And what they were discovering is that this is the number of backlinks. This is the example I was talking about. In theory, more links are better. But if you notice, this is ranking one, this is ranking third page of Google. So ranking one, and if you're in, it's hard to see, but if you're in finance, you need a lot less links. In fact, the more links you get, the more likely you are to rank on page three. Did you see that? It like blows your mind. I saw these screens and I was like, oh my gosh, my head is exploding. And here's a different one. So here is Cash Advance Fresno, California. This is the one that's ranking well. It's the single Cash Advance place in Fresno, California. Does not have a lot of backlinks. 17 domains referring to it, only 21 internal links. This one, which has 52,000 websites linking to it, is ranking 12 because it's a directory listing of a whole bunch of places. It's not particularly the Fresno, California cash advance place I can go walk to, right? So there's rules. I'm not saying don't follow the rules, but I am saying that when it comes to you creating a strategy for how am I gonna rank for this particular keyword, you have to look at search result pages. And you have to figure out this thing called searcher's intent. What is the intent of the searcher? Can I match it? How do I create content around that? That seems all confusing, I have a free guide for it. So if you're like, how do I even figure this out? I'm not covering it tonight, but register on my website. You can certainly grab the guide for free. Um, and then sometimes you don't even need links. I have clients and I work with some other firms where they get great rankings without links. They do a really good job of answering that searcher's intent and people click through. Yeah. But it does come back to clearly knowing that you are the best answer for that person's burning question that's encapsulated by that keyword phrase. 
That's really, really important. So after you get past the technical stuff, make sure you rock it in the content end. And that will generally propel you into good rankings, depending on your search result. Okay, now we're gonna talk about personalization because we're all in our own bubble. We especially know this after the most recent election, correct? Everybody's got a Facebook bubble. Everybody's aware of this now. <laughs> right? So unfortunately, and I actually taught a class on this at Online Marketing Institute, each of the social platforms personalizes to you. And I don't know if you've noticed this. I'm a dork, so I have, but all of them. So the head of personalization at LinkedIn used to be head of the Saudi intelligence. Wow. Yeah. I mean, creepy personalization. Pinterest, Pinterest will personalize to you. Did you know that if you have a pin it button on your website and a visitor from Pinterest finds that pin it button, you're sending data directly back to Pinterest. So when that person goes back to Pinterest, they're gonna see more of your stuff in their feed. All the platforms do that. That's why they give out those native buttons. So anyway, social's personalized, search is personalized. Let's talk about how much search is personalized. Okay, so first of all, it's personalized by your location, your device, depending on how many devices. It's also personalized by your dashboard, google.com slash dashboard, you can sign in. Okay, caveat, they say they're not, they don't blatantly say they're personalizing based on this, let me step back. I'm just gonna show you what data Google has on you, and we know it personalizes to you, period. Okay, they don't say they personalize based on this, but you go into your dashboard. <laughs> and you can see here, this is what Google knows about me. I've had 47,000 Gmail conversations, and they know everybody in my contact list and they know that I have two Android devices, and I know I use Google search on my Android phone. By the way, if you go into your dashboard, you can hear your own voice talk back to you. All of your voice queries are captured by Google, and you can hear your own voice. Yeah, so I told you this is the creepy part. I told you there'd be a creepy part. Anyway, books, other branded accounts, my calendar, et cetera, et cetera. This is not even the full list. I cut off a lot. And then this is your ad preferences. This is them guessing based on your search behavior. And they can get super, super smart about this. So they know that, I do like blues. I'm into action adventure films. The combat sports is a little weird, but they do know that I was potty training, which I was, my potty training my daughter. And I'm, I do a lot of searching online for recipes. And I have a dog. Anyway, so they know a lot about you. But we also know that they personalize based on your IP, your previous search history, if you're signed into Google, everything in your Google Plus account, all that's free game. Things you visited, if you happen to notice that certain websites are showing up over others, that's because Google figures it out. So they know I'm a HuffPost reader, so I see a lot more HuffPost than something else. There's a great book about it, by the way, it's called The Filter Bubble, written by Eli Pariser. It's kind of dated, but it's still very much accurate to today. And as a side note, I babysit him when he was eight. <laughs> um, but anyway, you should check out The Filter Bubble. It basically talks about how from a political standpoint, we might be in trouble because we're all in filtered bubbles. And especially after the Trump election, I think it's very interesting and it's interesting for online marketing too. Yeah. So I do a lot of Google searching for my clients. Mm -hmm. Does Google know the difference? Uh, Google know the difference between your work and your personal profile. Stop it. Mm -hmm. How? Well, if you're G Suite? Yeah, either your G Suite or, yeah, because I have two accounts. So right. they will show me different stuff in my G Suite versus my Gmail account or if you have two different machines. No. I have I have clients like I have clients at National Cancer Institute. They definitely see different rankings because Google knows what office they're sitting in. And in fact, I don't think I have an example here. But Moss has got this great example where um, they saw their cause they have a software that they sell, and their customer support team when they were googling, it was something like getting started with Moss or something. The the article that showed up was detailed instructions about how to get started. And if you were outside Mozplex, so you weren't in that IP, and you did the same search, you would actually see just the intro landing page to learn more about the software. Very interesting. Anyway, what, there was another question. Missed it. Oh, I yeah. Didn't, but now I do. Okay. Uh, are there business services where they sell persona profiles, like mm -hmm. and they just sell, for example, everything about the woman? who is like 50 to 55, who owns a dog, has two kids, and lives in, I don't know, in Alexandria, and has two cars. Can you buy that kind of package? You everything? could, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's your target audience. It is your target audience. Yeah, yeah, there's databases where you can grab that information. Yeah. Um, so let me give you one more example of personalized search. So this one is, I'm working at Ketchum on Toshiba Medical as my client. 
Um, it just so happened we were doing some Googling. This is my um, colleague in LA. And the search results were just so creepy. I was like, oh, send me a screenshot. I want to use this for my training. So it's a little dated, but stuff like this happens all the time now still. So anyway, so she had a medical. She's looking for a 3D prenatal ultrasound. Screenshot's a little hard to see, but basically what you're seeing is map results for places you can go in California for prenatal ultrasound. Let me tell you what's going on in my life before I show you my screenshot. Okay, so I was about to celebrate my daughter's first birthday. Not pregnant with kid number two yet, but we've had kid number one. And I was emailing with my mother because my brother was getting married in California in Monterey. And mom wanted to do some sort of cool family trip from Monterey to San Diego just because. It's like a family trip. That's in my Gmail account. Okay. Let me show you my results. I'm in DC. Whoa, this Whoa. is my results. Yeah, creepy. Okay, first of all, it's showing me how to get a prenatal ultrasound in San Diego. <laughs> and look at the pictures. It's showing me pictures of babies. What right? are your keywords? What, what did you 3D put? prenatal ultrasound, the same <laughs> keyword. Whoa. Now you tell me Google doesn't read your email. Uh, yeah, it's right? It does. It does. Okay, so we're all marketers. That's how personalized your end consumer is. Holy cow, do you have to know who they are? Yeah, you really have to know who they are. Because even if you use a rank tracking tool, all that's doing is stripping all this out. And what is that gonna tell you? I mean, it's something, but is it telling you truly what your end user is seeing? No, question? We have some, uh, you know, complete obvious uh, SEO and all. Would you say that uh, data mining is something that uh, you, know, you pretty much have to uh, really delve into? Yes. Yes, if you, were on, if you were on any of my teams, everyone who gets trained by me gets addicted to data because it is important to know not only as deep as possible who your target audience is, but then it's also mission critical that you understand your web analytics. Because even if you follow all this stuff, you're gonna to get to a point where it's not working. And you just have to see how your current users are actually interacting with the website, and depending on where you get there, you might then start getting a little frustrated by how dirty your Google Analytics data is. It's generally the journey you go on, right, Marissa? Yeah. And then you really want to clean it up, and then you want to do cool things with GA, and that's what Marissa will be talking about. We work a lot on different client projects, because I get very excited about stuff to do, and then I get her to help me figure it out. <laughs> um, so anyway, the rankings are dead. It's the other big takeaway. I don't know how many times I was on phone calls with CEOs at Ketchum, and they were paranoid about something nasty that was showing up number one for them on their machine, because they clicked on it a lot. <laughs> and half the time I put it into a ranking tool and it's not anywhere in page one. Right, because it's personalized to them. Not that there isn't reputation management issues, there are. Um, but, you know, just keep an eye on what you're actually trying to measure. Because if you're not going to measure rankings, then what do you end up measuring? People to your website? Potentially people coming in from, because you've got Google Search Console data, which is the only place you can see where on average you rank for a particular keyword. Data directly from Google. That gives you some insight, that's real data, right? And then you can actually see organic search coming into your landing pages, you can see that data, and whether or not people you know, do stuff and sign up and that kind of thing. This is why you move real quickly from, oh my god, I gotta know what's in my web analytics account. So you gotta, you know, do you really know your customers? Because Google can pivot in 10 minutes and understand a new context for you and change all the search results. So. Google, in theory, I just told you I have kids, I'm married, but pretend I'm not. Pretend suddenly my boyfriend proposed to me. In 10 minutes, Google can figure out that that life event happened and start pivoting. So if I start looking for rentals, it'll be wedding rentals. And if I start looking for suddenly trips to the Bermuda, it will be honeymoon vacations. Because they can start figuring that out. And it will save future context for you. So it'll do that, it'll save the honeymoon context. Like for me, did you notice it saved? I already had one kid, Google knew that. It was saving the next one, the prenatal ultrasound for the next one, right? <laughs> creepy, creepy, creepy. So anyway, you need to know your customers in order to reach them and you need to know what your competition's doing. Maybe they're not doing anything. Maybe you've got a headshot, you know? But depending on the keyword, maybe they've got an SEO team of seven. It depends, it depends on your industry. Some are tougher than others. All right, let's talk about what's next. These are old quotes, but they'll make you creeped out. Um, this one's actually, I think, five years old. This is Eric Schmidt. <coughs> Based on everything you give us, we know who you are, we know what, where you've been, we more or less know what you're thinking. 
And this is from, I swear, I think it's at least five years ago. And here's my favorite. So this is, I told you I did wearable computers, right? This is Ray Kurzweil. He's the premier expert in artificial intelligence. He is the one who created voice recognition technology, object character recognition, so understanding images that are digital. He's got 24 different patents to his name. I've seen this guy speak, in fact. He speaks at like TED type events that I used to be involved in. And he is like off in left field. He really wants to be a cyborg. He wants a chip in his brain. So I'm serious. You gotta read about Ray, seriously. He's been at Google for five years. He's one of their heads of search, okay? So this is the kind of expertise Google's got. Everyone said, why did they do Google Glass? Well, there's two reasons. One, Gray, you know, Ray always wanted to offset his memory into the cloud. Mm, I've heard of that. Yeah, you're looking at stuff and you're putting it in the cloud with glass. The other reason is without necessarily searching, you're looking at things and talking. And Google's collecting all that data. Right? Yeah. So anyway, and he actually says, I can envision some years from now, the majority of the searches will be solved without you actually having the pain of speaking or typing. That's what he wants. He wants that perfect <laughs> moment where Google Now on your phone. How many people have an Android? Where it just sort of tells you what you need to know, sort of. It's not perfect yet, but it's working on it. So they actually did this focus group where they hired people to wander around with the phones in the pocket, and Google just called them and said, what were you thinking about that you didn't search for? So that's what they're tracking. They want to get there. And this is the reality. So that's a little futuristic, but here's the reality of voice search. Look at this trajectory of voice search. Right? More. And you know why? Because Google's at 95% accuracy. Especially if you start talking to it, it gets very smart about you. And it can really start giving you good answers based on the mumbly gobbly gook, quick talking stuff like me that I talk to the phone. It can figure it out. Um, so by 2020, Mary Maker is predicting that 50% of all searches will be search or image, which is interesting. And you're probably not optimizing for Google image search. There's extra stuff you can do there. But a lot of us are actually searching for images. It's not all fifth graders looking for free photos for their homework. Um, and voice search. It's a big deal. It's not only go Google Home and Alexa and then me searching on my phone, right? And so that's where it's the give me what I'm meaning, not what I'm actually saying that they're getting smarter about. And I want to know what I can do oftentimes when I'm searching. And so to optimize that, you actually need to write with a definitive answer based on that question. And you have to do the schema stuff where they understand the actual topics you're talking about on the page. All right, I did not preload this, but it's worth me loading. Unless it takes forever. Has anybody heard about Hound? Because the other thing we need to pay attention to as search marketers is personal assistants who can provide us answers. So here's personal assistant. That's probably one of the, it's actually, this is an old video. It's two years old, I think. Probably one of the creepiest. And I, hopefully you can hear it. So this is the part of the presentation where I tell you, you've got to get all the basics, and then you've got to get into the data piece, right? Because the future is actually now, and all this stuff I'm showing you is actually dated, okay? So, and it changes fast. However, if you like to learn, join me. It's a fun industry to be in, but it is very fast-paced. Um, so here's the most recent research about, this is Moz and Jumpshot. This is from last year, I believe, talking about where people search. So Google does have a lot of volume, but 26% of people start with Google image search. Weird, that is more than Yahoo and Bing. So, it's, good, it's important to tackle Google, but then you gotta tackle the next thing, right? Which is Google image search, slightly different to optimize for, and then right after that would be YouTube, definitely different to optimize for. I'm gonna skip this. Oh, actually we're almost at the end. Um, so let's talk through Recap how you get started. There was a lot. Okay. 
Step one, get your free data from the search engines, right? Which I've mentioned a couple times. So if you do nothing else, go home, turn on Google Search Console and Big Web Master Tools. Try to get smart about your consumer as much as possible. Do some keyword research. Take a look by keyword at the SERPs before you start writing. So use the incognito if nothing else, use your keyword. Just take a look at what's ranking, how long they are, what, how they answer the question. You can get smart and actually look at backlinks, but at the very least say, do they have images, that kind of stuff. Take notes. I have a writing template that can help you with some of this on my website. Um, make sure you've got your technical stuff in order. Could potentially hurt you depending, you need to do an audit for that. Um, you need to build relationships and promote. After all that, then you have to do Marissa's stuff. You have to look at your analytics because you're only gonna get so far. And then you have to read. Read and stay on top of stuff. That's it. That's, that's it, that's <laughs> it. So, um, <laughs> so if you're interested, you can register on my website for more information. I have the top 11 ways to learn SEO. Don't just start learning anywhere on the internet. There's a lot of people talking garbage that don't know what they're talking about. So in that blog post, I actually outlined the industry leaders that you should follow. Search engine land's great, marketing land's great. Um, there's a couple people on Twitter, like Rand Fishkin, who was the founder of Moz. It's great to follow. Mike King, you heard me talk about earlier. It's great. Um, but make sure you only follow the folks that they're, that they're talking about. Otherwise, you're going to go down a rabbit hole and do something that was working three years ago, but not now.